So at, at the end of the lecture of the lab, my objectives are that you will be able to play with some gene and identifiers and gene attributes, that you understand how simple enrichment tools work, and that you get familiarized with the cytoscape software. So the starting point of a pathway and network analysis is a gene list. So it could be like a medium-sized gene list or a very uh, large gene list, and it, comes, it can come from a, a proteomics or genomics experiment. So what you want to do is to interpret your gene list. So you want to know what is interesting about your gene list in an automatic and unbiased way. So for example, you want to know if your gene list is enriched in some known pathways. So first, what you are going to do is to find the overlap between your gene list and some gene annotation that are stored in some pathway databases. So for pathway enrichment analysis, what we use is the prior knowledge of the genes that are stored in pathway databases. So this information is collected regularly and we need we, we say that the pathway are uh, that we curate the databases and then we visualize the results as a map because it's a more intuitive way to interpret the results so now what do you mean by pathway so for biologists we are more interested by signaling pathway and metabolic pathway so signaling pathway that would be like a receptor at the surface of the membrane that is activated, and there is like a downstream signaling cascade. And a metabolic pathway that would be more like a reaction, like more the biosynthesis of vitamin, for example. But we can use, for enrichment tool, we can use also databases that have like a broader content, like drug or disease association. And this can be very useful. And another term that you may hear a lot during this lecture is gene set. So what is the definition of a gene set? A gene set is a group of genes. So it's more specific than a pathway. So a pathway would be, for example, you can have like a big pathway that is divided into sub-pathway, and each sub-pathway could be like a gene set. So what are the advantages of doing a pathway and network? analysis, well, it saves time compared to the traditional approach. So the traditional approach would be to read information about your genes one by one. And actually, so it's, it, it takes a lot of time to do that, and sometimes it's all also biased because you finally you end up uh, looking only on your favorite genes. And pathway and network analysis is also an, an intuitive way of analyzing the results. So we all know that within a cell, we have a lot of signaling pathway and metabolic pathway that are interconnected. And when we create a network, it's like drawing this map that we have in our mind. And on this map, we put our data. So it's much easier to interpret the results. The other advantage is that we can add different layers of information. So we can overlap different information at the pathway level. For example, you have RNA-seq data and you have mutation data. And you take your top hits of your RNA-seq data and the top hits of your mutation data, but they, they are not the same gene. So you don't find a direct overlap. It doesn't mean you don't have an overlap at the pathway level. So maybe these genes belong to the same pathway. So, so this is an example. So you have patient one that has mutation one, patient two has mutation two, and patient three has mutation three. So you cannot find the same mutations in different samples. So the mutations are mutually exclusive. So when you directly compare the, the patient, there is nothing that is similar. But all these Mutations in these genes are belonging to the same pathway, and all these patients are diabetic, for example. So this is a first example of real data using mutation data and pathway network analysis. So this is a Nature paper in 2012. So they had this uh, chromosome 5 deletion that they found in breast cancer sam samples. So they look at, at the genes within this chromosome 5 deletion. They extract the gene list and they did an enrichment map, so this network. So on this network, 
one circle is a pathway. And what they found is that the chromosome 5 deletion genes are enriched in genes implicated in cell cycle. So that's the same data, but now it's not an, what we call an enrichment map, but it's a, a network uh, created by the Reactome FI plugin that you are going to see this afternoon. And now each circle is a gene. And the different colors are the functional modules associated with this network. Now, another example that we are going to see in the lab practical, so the same data as we used before with Daniel, it's come from this uh, paper that gather glioblastoma, glioblastoma samples, so glioblastomizer cancer, brain cancer, and one major result of the, the paper is that they found 71 significantly mutated genes, one of them being EGFR, so epidermal growth factor receptor. And another result, major result of this paper is that some of the mutations were found mutually exclusive. So now, can we add all these different la layers of information in one network? So all this information were available at separate tables in the paper, can we add them all in the network? So this is the network that was created with GeneMania. And the layers of information are the frequency of mutation, so the, the size of the node. The shape is if the mutations are mutually exclusive related to EGFR. The pink color is the, the pathway that was the most significant pathway in this database, in this uh, data set. And uh, we also see the physical interaction and the genetic interactions. So now when we add these layers all together, I think we can see that one set of genes can attract our curiosity. So they seem to cooperate or to work together. So if I had to work on that project, I would not only focus on EGFR, but probably on these other genes that are related, like PIK3R1 or PIK3CA. So I think it was obvious that this cluster of genes work together. So a last example, how to overlap two, laser, two layers of information. So now this network is a pathway network. So each circle represents pathways that were enriched in one subtype of the glioblastoma, called proneural. And the yellow triangle is the 71 significantly mutated genes. And now we can see where the mutated genes are located in the pathway map. So we have genes belonging to some pathway that are significantly enriched in this subtype of cancer. So what are the three elements of pathway and network analysis? Then first, we need our gene list. We need gene attributes that store the functional annotation of the genes that are stored in pathway databases. And we also need enrichment tools that will calculate the overlap between the gene list and the pathway that we are testing. And these tools are also going to tell us if this overlap is significant or not. So let's talk about the gene list first. So first, some recommendations between you start a pathway analysis. So try to get like a clean list. So as clean as possible. So try to normalize, to adjust for background, to remove outliers. Because what we say sometimes is garbage in, garbage out. So try to get as much as possible a majority of true positive in your gene list that you are going to use for pathway network analysis. The gene list size matters too. It can also help you to choose the right tool. So if you have like a very small gene list, then you can use function prediction tool. If, uh, if you have like a medium sized tool, like uh, 50 to 500 genes, you can use simple enrichment tools. If you have like a very large gene list, more than 1,000, you want to try to rank your genes by significance and use tools that use this ranking as input. And make sure that your gene IDs 
are compatible with the software that you are going to use. So where do gene lists come from? Then they can, from multiple sources, and enrichment analysis can work with any of these gene lists, although you have to know that these tools have been developed first for gene expression data. So now new tools are, going, are being developed for more specific case, like if you have methylation data, you can use, for example, the, the tool GREAT. Before applying pathway network analysis, it's important that you have a clear idea of, of the question you want to answer. So you want to, to answer one biological question. You make sure that your experimental design to create to generate your gene list, yeah, to, is make make it possible for you to answer the question you, you is important for you, and then it will help you to to choose the right tool and to correctly interpret your results. So gene identifiers. Gene identifiers are ideally unique, stable names or numbers that represent your genes. They come from multiple databases, and these databases store slightly different kind of information, like gene databases will store gene sequence, protein databases will store protein sequence. So it means that one gene can have multiple IDs. And also, because these databases are slightly different, they don't completely overlap. So here is a list of common identifiers for you to know what they can look like. In red are the ones that are recommended, and the, with the three pink smileys are the ones that I use on a daily basis. So on a daily basis, I use ensemble gene IDs, untraced gene IDs, and official gene symbol. GeneCart is a tool that I like to use. So GeneCart is like a, it's a gene database. And when I want to retrieve my untraced gene ID very rapidly, I just enter the name of the genes and I get like a lot of gene identifiers. And if I scroll down, many more uh, information. So we are going to use this tool in the lab later. So untraced gene ID. This one is my favorite gene, ID, gene identifiers. So why? Because it's stable. It's a numerical value, so it's very easy to manipulate. And for genes that are, let's say, new or not yet annotated, they already have an untraced ID, even if, if they don't have like an official gene symbol. So if you use untraced gene ID, you don't have to update your annotation all the time. OK, so we have seen that one gene can have multiple IDs. So that can be an issue. And you have to be sure that your software use the, the identifier that you have on your gene list. So you may need to convert from one identifier to the other identifiers. And that could be a challenge. So you have to be careful when, when you do this conversion. And I think the most frequent mistake is when we use Excel. Because what Excel does is automatic change, automatically change the, some gene names into dates. OK? So like Oct4 Oct is going to change in October 4. And uh, yeah, I see that every day in my work. So here are the slide. So at the right side, you have the correct symbol. And on the left side, you have this same gene name that are transformed to date. And if you don't do anything, if you save it again, they will be just numbers. And the problem is that your enrichment tool is not going to recognize these symbols. So it's just going to ignore that. So um, there is a trick, I mean, not, not a trick, but there is an option in Excel to format your column as text. OK, so if you format your column, as text first, and then you copy and paste your gene symbol, they should not be changed. But I know it's difficult. So I think my the best advice that I can give you is look at your gene list. If it's not too big, look if you have dates. And if you have dates, then look back at my slide and try to change to the correct name. So fortunately, we have some tools that have been developed 
that help us to convert from gene, identi one gene identifiers to the other gene identifiers. And so one of them is gconvert that we are going to use in the lab that is really easy to use. And I would like to mention also Biomod Ensemble. It's not as easy to use, but it's at, it has a lot of features. So you can copy and paste your gene list and retrieve any gene attributes you like, like uh, gene identifiers, but also sequences and author logs. So our recommendation is that you need to map everything to Entrace Gene ID using a spreadsheet. If you need 100% coverage, then you need to manually create your missing annotations and be careful of Excel auto conversions. A last tip is that when you have your table of results, try to keep at least two common identifiers all the time or even more. So if one tool use one and the other tool use another one, then you have all your data ready. So what have we learned? So that Gene and their products have made many identifiers that Bioinformatics requires conversion of IDs from one type to the other, but ID mapping services are available. And please use standard and common user, uh, used identifiers. OK, so now we're going to start the second part, which are the gene attributes and the pathway database. So when we use pathway network analysis, we are more interested by function annotation. That's called the biological process, molecular function, and cell location. These information are stored in different pathway databases, like the gene ontology, CAG, or reactor. So today, um, this morning, I'm going to describe the gene ontology, and I think you are going to see reactum this afternoon. So gene ontology is the largest database. It's updated regularly, and it covers many organisms. And many enrichment tools use just Go as the reference databases. So Go is divided in three major parts. One is cellular component, the second part is molecular function, and the third part is biological process. So let's say the term plasma membrane, that would be a cellular component. This isomerase activity that transforms the glucose into fructose, that would be a molecular function. And cell division, that would be a biological process. So what is helpful to understand is that the Go database is organized as a hierarchy. So you have more general terms at the top of the hierarchy and more specific terms at the bottom of the hierarchy. So here uh, you have large gene sets and small specific terms. And what you need to know also is that one term can have one or more parents terms and one or more child terms. So when you take one gene and you want to retrieve the Go terms associated with these genes, you you retrieve multiple Go terms, so that's why, because of these relationships between the terms. So genes are linked or associated with Go terms by curators. These associations are called Go annotations. So this is an example of manual curation focused on the PERC1 genes. And so how these Go annotations have been related. So receptor like kinase would be a molecular function associated with the PERC1 gene. Integral membrane protein would be the cellular component associated with these genes. And wound response would be the biological process associated with this gene. So already three go terms for one gene. So there are different ways to get this annotations, not only manual curations, and you can find out looking at these evidence codes. Here, the IC, IDA, TAS, TS, IEA. And the one I sh just showed you is probably a TAS, a traceable author statement. So if you run an enrichment analysis and 
you have one go term that is very significant and you want to know more about that term, then you can use tools to get more information. Like quick go is one of these tools. You can get the child terms and the parent terms and the definition of the term. And a very related tool is Amigo. This slide is just to remember that we're focusing on the function annotation, but we there is there are many other gene attributes that are available, like chromosome position, this is association protein properties. And all these other gene attributes can be available from uh, Ansible Biomart. Yeah? Is there differences between quick go and amigo? I couldn't find any differences and they they relate to each other so when you're on uh, quick go you can access amigo when you're on amigo you can access quick go so uh, myself I couldn't see any okay. <laughs> any differences but maybe there must be some otherwise why why, why yeah. two tools but I couldn't see any so what have we learned so gene attributes define functions, characteristics of a gene. Many genes attributes are available in the databases, and I've just presented the gene ontology databases, but there are other ones like Keg and Reactome. OK. So now we go to the third part, which are the enrichment tools. So we have our gene list, one side, and we have our functional annotation. Now the enrichment tools, what they are going to do is to find the overlap between the gene list and the pathways that are, we are testing. And they are going to tell us if this overlap is significant or not. So many enrichment tools exist. So they can be classified into three groups. The first one is overrepresentation analysis. The second one is functional class scoring. And the third one is pathway topology. So the, fir the, the first one is the most simple tool. And this is the one that I'm going to explain later. And it's really good for mid-size gene lists. So maybe if you have 100 genes to 500 genes or up to 1,000 genes. One famous tool was David. So I don't know if you heard about David. So it's you can still use David. It's a very good tool, but it's not up to date anymore. So the path, pathway database underlying the tool are not up to date. So that's why we don't recommend David anymore. And we recommend uh, G-Provider now. And Yuri is the developer of G-Provider. So if you have questions during the lab, feel free to ask him. And then the second class of, um, of, of tools is functional class scoring. So I would suggest that this tool is more for larger list. And if you can rank your, gist, your, your genes from most significant to, to less significant one. And one very popular tool is GSEA, gene set enrichment analysis. And the third way, the third one is the pathway topology tool, Reactum FI, is on one example that you are going to see this afternoon. And this one is more complicated. So it takes into account the relationships between the genes. So for example, you have a pathway, and you have uh, 10 genes that overlap between your gene list and this pathway. And 10 genes are activators. They are on the same activating branch of the pathway. This is going to get a better score then another case where you have 10 genes, but five are activators and five are inhibitors. So it takes into account the topology of the network in addition to the size of the overlap. So tips for overrepresented tools. Again, if you have like a gene list, a small gene list, you can use tool like GeneMania. If you have like a small, medium-sized list, you can use to like G profiler. If you have more than that, try to order your query. There is an option in G profiler to order your query, so you can do that in G profiler. And if you have like a large gen gen list, 
try to order your gene list using GSEA or Wilkerson rank test. So what is gene set enrichment uh, analysis? So the first step is to break down the cellular function into gene sets. So here are the four gene sets that I'm going to test. So I'm going to test nucleopore, ribosome, cell cycle, and P53 signaling. I'm going to find the overlap between my gene list and these four gene sets. So how many genes are in common? And then I'm going to see if this overlap is significant or not. So here is a very general and conceptual slide that can help be applied to many enrichment tools and that explains all the significance of the results calculated. So let's say I have a gene list that contains 200 genes. And my pathway, let's say apoptosis, contains 100 genes. And the overlap between my gene list and the pathway is 20 genes. So that's the first result. So I have 20 genes that overlap. Is this overlap larger than expected by chance? How do I assess that? I can do some randomization. So there is two ways to do the randomization. First, you can imagine that you can randomize your gene list. So you replace your 200 genes by random genes, and you do it 2,000 times. So how many times, if you take these 200 random genes, are you going to have an overlap of 20? You can do it the other way around. You can take your pathway that contains 100 genes and randomize this pathway. You do 2,000 times. How many times, if I take 100 genes randomly, do I have 20 genes that overlap with my gene list? From this randomization, you are going to get a p-value that tests the significance. So if you have a low p-value, close to zero, it means it's probably not by chance. So this overlap of 20 cannot occur by random chains. So it's highly significant. So many of these enrichment tools, like David or G Profiler, what they use is a Fisher's exact test. So let's say you have your gene list that contains four black genes and one, one red one. And your background population will contain 500 black genes, so that would be the pathway that you are testing, and 4,500 red genes. So first, there is like the null hypothesis, list is a random sample from population, or the alternative hypothesis, you have more black genes than expected in, in your list. So the first step of the Fisher's exact test is to calculate the null distribution. So let's say you have 45 red genes in your background population and 500 black genes. What is the probability to obtain five red genes by random chance? That the probability is 57%. What is the probability to get four red genes and what black genes? Then the probability is a little bit lower. It would be 35%. Now, this is our case. We have four black genes and one red genes. What is the probability to get that? Well, the probability is very low to get that by chance, so it's very close to zero. Now, the p-value that you are going to obtain would be the p-value at the cutoff, so our cutoff is four black genes and one red genes, plus the p-value that are less than our cutoff. So if it's close to zero, it's highly significant, we don't think it can happen by chance only. Yep. Um, that's a good question. There is, if we should differentiate up-regulate genes and down-regulate genes when we do enrichment analysis. What do you feel like, how does up-regulate, how does down-regulate, it's, it's very hard to say the genes, the pathways are up-regulate. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So it depends on your input. If you, in, so for a Fisher's exacted, 
exact test, you cannot differentiate. So if you put your 200 genes, it will not tell you if they are up and down because you don't give that information. Okay, so what you could do if you use these tools is to separate yourself the upregulated genes to the downregulated genes. If you want to, to see if, uh, if the upregulated genes are enriched in some pathway and the downregulated genes are enriched in some pathway. This is what I usually do. You also could use tools like GACA when you ranked all your data from the upregulated to the downregulated. And then you have two types of results. You will have like a positive score for, for the upregulated genes and like a negative score for the downregulated genes. So you can separate the two. So in gene profile, you cannot do that? Uh, no, it's, it's up to you to decide if you want, because I think it's easier to interpret if you divide this separately your up and your down regulated genes. So you see, okay, this is the enriched pathway in my upregulated genes, and then my second list, this is my 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 pathway enriched in my downregulated genes. But the output of a pathway analysis is really we know that there is a modification of the pathway, but because we don't know if these genes are activators or inhibitors of the pathway, we cannot conclude too much if the pathway is upregulated or activated or inhibited. So you have, you know something is going on with the pathway, but at the second step, after your enrichment analysis, you really need to, to look at the genes that were in this overlap and look if they are activators and inhibitors. So the third class of, the, the third class of uh, tools that I showed you try, are trying to answer that question, but not the simple tools that I'm going to mention. Um, sorry, I don't understand how these numbers are well, the 500 black genes and 45 red genes, and then in the test we have 5 red and 45 black. So that's, that, that, that's a, a second slide. So are the five genes? Oh, so, so the background population, let's say it's you have, so the background population would be your whole genome. So the whole genome. So let's say the total number of genes that you have. And the black genes would be the pathway that you are testing. Okay, so, so just an example. So let's say you have 4,500 genes in your, that are red in your population and only 500 that are black. That would be the cell cycle pathway, for example. And in your gene list, coming from your data, you have four genes that are belong, belonging to this cell cycle pathway, so black genes, and one gene that is coming from other pathways. And now we want to, to answer the question, is it possible to get four black genes out of five just by random chance? And we know that we have much more red genes than, than black genes in our population. So already we can figure out that it should not be by chance only. If you, if you pick five genes randomly, what is the chance of, get, of getting four black genes and one gene if you have this gene universe? Very, very, very low. So your p-value calculated by the Fisher's exact test is going to be close to zero. No, I just had different numbers here. Okay. I had five red and 45 black okay. instead of 500 uh, black. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. So is, are there any results saying that if you incorporate that type of stuff, you're going to get the same thing? So, 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 you make this okay? so it depends. So if you are really like a, so let's say you have your mutation data and everything is ready, you have your gene list. And you, the simple question you want to answer is that are these genes in my gene list belonging to the same pathway, then, then yes, you can use this enrichment tool. And you don't need, 
additional information. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but I think if you have is, if your gene list uh, if your gene list is ten genes, yeah, you have eight black and two red. I think the p value would change. If you so have it's the same, it's the same proportion. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we have four numbers that are that are taken into account. The, the universe size, so yes. the to total number your universe, your gene list size, and the number of black and red. So yes, that would change. But does it make sense to change? Like, uh, is it biologically significant? Um, Yeah, there is pros and cons. I think this is really like a simple method. There is actually, in G-Profiler, there is also one option, I think this is very interesting, when you can order the, the query. And you, I mean, I think you really can talk about that later. So it's the same p-value, but if your gene is ranked number one by the significance, it's going to be more important than if, if you're like a gene, this gene is number 10. So I think it will differentiate this kind of of uh, of cases. If you like, you said yeah. that it does iterations, right? So yeah, kind of, kind of resamples. It does this over and over and over and over. So. Uh, yeah, there, there is no null. Uh, in, the, in this case, the Fisher's exact test calculated the null distribution first, based on the the equation. But you do one or the other. You either do it. You either compute the, the p-value analytically, right, or you do the, the resampling. Yeah, so the resampling actually that I should, that, yeah, is, is, is more general, okay? There are different ways to do it. And the Fisher's exact test calculate the null distribution, the hypergeometric distributions. This is the way this test works. So, so you understand that for the Fisher's exact test, then the size of the background population change the results. So most of the case, you are going to do like a whole genome experiment. So your background is going to be all genes in the genome. But in, some, yeah, in certain cases, you, you can have like custom chip where you just have, for example, kinases or immune genes. So in this case, the background is going to be smaller, and you need to input your background list. So in, in general, many of these tools, there is an option to upload the background, and that's for that reason, because the background is taking into consider consideration to calculate the p-value. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what is kind of the bigger question that you're trying to answer with this test, like what is kind of the, the signal that we're trying to detect? Is that this pathway is involved, is activated in this patient, or is perturbed in this patient, or I've just... So perturbed would be more accurate than activated, because as I said, if, if you really need to look at the function of the genes that overlap between your gene list and the pathway that you are testing to see if, it, if they are activators or inhibitors. And you may have like a mix of activators and inhibitors. But what it's answering is that you have 100 genes, 100 mutated genes. And maybe, I don't know, 30 of them belong to a cell cycle event, OK? And that, or another pathway that you, you don't know about. So it would have been very difficult to know that information just looking at the, all these genes that you don't know. Okay, so that's the simple question these tools are going are trying to answer. So are these many of these genes in your gene list known to be related to each other in in any of the databases that you are testing? You can you can even test like a like a drug database. So are they the target of the same drug, for example? Are they known to be associated with the same disease? 
or are they known to be associated with autophagy? So that's really the question. It just appears like you're testing whether you know, these genes are part of this pathway, are more likely to be part of this pathway than some other random set of genes. So the, like the overlap. Because we have the list. Yeah, so it's, it's more that we, we know the association. So if we trust the pathway database, we know the association. Mm -hmm. We know that gene A is in cell cycle. Mm -hmm. But the Fisher's exact test is trying to give you a p value to, to, to get the confidence. Can we trust these results or can we? because we have many false positives in, the, in this kind of results. So we need to assess what are the most significant to the ones that are less significant. And the way to do it is to, as I say, to try to, to randomize. So by chance only, can we get that by chance only? So it's really to get the significance out of the results, not the overlap, because the overlap we know, this for sure, these 20 genes belong to the cell cycle. but are my data clean? Can I trust my data? Yeah. Recall that this is coming from, like, let's say we're carrying over from yesterday Sarab's single nucleotide variant yeah. stuff. Well, how much confidence all did we have if there was only a few uh, tumor reads that had that mutation? Right? And then now that's become our gene list of mutations, but you know, this, this is adding a layer of I'm just trying, I'm kind of just struggling with like what conclusion can I make? Like suppose I, we, we found out that yes, it's, this is a significant result and so these, yeah. these mutated genes are part of this pathway and, and you know, Yeah, so then that's the beginning of everything. Then, yeah, so then. I think this is only telling you that given a list of 100 genes, uh, any list of 100 genes, uh, what is the probability of 10 out of those will be in randomly in the cell cycle pathway? Yeah, and, and the example is 100 genes, but you can have yeah, 1,000, yeah. 2,000 genes, and you cannot do it manually. So you need to do it automatically using these tools, and, and you, you need to rank all these results by, by a p-value for the most significant one to them up because sometimes you have many, 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 many significant results, many, many pathways that came up significant. So you want to distinguish the ones that may be more likely true positive from false positive. And then that's the beginning of everything. Then you think, oh, my, the, the, the first pathway, the top pathway is autophagy or is, is cell cycle. So now I need to look at the genes and to understand how it works. But then you, you need to do it manually. Or so, you need to go back to the wet lab. I'm sorry. So the data set that we're using, we're using from the database as our background, and then we're using the wet lab as the background. And then what are the mutated genes in our sample? We look at the Fisher ex exact test. But the p values that we're deriving is based on the previous data, how commonly these genes are mutated in different experiments. And then it gives me the test. Is that what you're saying? Uh, For example, if I have like 20 apoptosis genes, and yeah. Whatever. Yeah. But then, then this data sets will look at the, the the previous probability based on the previous data that we have, and that gives me a p value. That's how, even though like if I have ten genes mutated in apoptotic pathway, for example, ten genes. Are so ten mutated, out of. Like all apoptotic pathways, yeah. right? there are like hundred genes, and then I'm choosing them from the database. How do I know my data, like MDM2, is more important in my data set, not BCL2, that I compare the data set with my data set? So it, it, it will not answer that question. It will not. It will not. It will just tell you, can, you, you can add different layers of information when you create the network. Okay. But for the simple enrichment tool, it will not answer that question. It's really, if you, if you database that you are testing in the pathway database, it will just take the, 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 the pathways. Okay, it will give me just the pathways. But what is the p-value coming from? What is the p-value? So let's say you have, so maybe we can take the example of the, of the lab practical. So they have these 291 glioma-blastoma samples so from different patients. And they did this old exome sequencing. And they looked 
to find mutated genes and they look to find the genes that were drivers, the more likely to be the driver genes. And if they end up with 71 genes. So these are the 71 significantly mutated genes in glioblastoma. Based on what? Based on the data? So that's their data. That's okay. their data. That, that's the, 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 the omics experiment. All the pre-processing has been done. And we think that in glioblastoma, we have 71 genes that are more likely to play a role in the development of the disease. That's why just running so that's, that's not enrichment and yeah. That's why just running a significantly mutated gene software, software, software. The exactly. So mute six, they ran mute six CV, basically, and they came up with a list of thirty one genes that are significantly mutated in that core. And that irrespective of pathway, irrespective of anything. So, so that's the data. That's not the pathway analysis. That's all the pre-processing that you may have seen during the workshop. And now you end up with this gene list. And you want to interpret this gene list. So you can look at the gene one by one and try to, to understand the function. Or you can try to do the analysis at once to try to understand the relationship within the genes. And the results, may, in this case, would be that a few genes are part of the same um, PI3K pathway. And you can do that in five minutes instead of looking gene by gene. And this is the only information, simple tools, like this, this one that uh, like, like David or Deep Profiler will answer for you if, you're the, if you are testing these pathway databases. Like, this sounds like this is a test of, for membership, right? So the test of significance is, am I confident that this is part of this pathway unless I'm misinterpreting this pathway? But if our database is already this curated resource that tells us what genes are in pathways, shouldn't we be able to look up the genes? Like, just count, you know, I have a mutated gene X. What pathways is it, you know, nominated in my database of choice? You, 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 take that as, as we round through. Yeah, you, you can do gene by gene if you want, yeah. So there is two different questions. So one is to relate one gene with this known functions, and the other one is to analyze as a, as a group of genes. So if you do it gene by gene, uh, Bernie showed earlier that So now a summary of the different steps of the enrichment analysis. So first, the overlap is tested with each gene set present in the pathway database. So here we show the example with one gene set, but actually we can test many, many gene sets, more than 3,000 gene sets. So now we need to order the results by the enrichment p-value to find out the most significant gene set. You want the lowest p-value. And then because we have tested so many genes, we need to adjust for the multiple hypothesis testing, and this is what we call the FDR. And we usually use the benjamini horberg method. So the FDR corrects for multiple hypothesis testing. So if you have like an FDR of 15%, it means you have like a 15% chance that your result are, is a false positive. So 85% chance that is a true positive. And why statisticians want to do that? They say that because we are testing so many pathways at the same time, we are incre increasing the chance of making wrong decision. So they think that the p-value are overestimated. So it's like a p-value of 0, 0, 0, 1, they think, oh, it's overestimated. We use the benjamini Hogberg method to correct that. And maybe now our p adjusted p-value is going to be 0 0.001. So a, type, a typical output of an enrichment analysis is a table that contains at least the, 
pathway or gene set names that we are testing, the number of overlapping genes, the number of genes in the original pathway, the p-value that tests the significance of this overlap, and the adjusted p-value. And the typical output is a long table with many, many gene sets, row by row, and it's usually very difficult to interpret. And it's difficult to interpret because the gene set, they contain genes that, that are redundant, okay? So they are not completely independent, this gene set. So maybe your gene set one, that is very significant, have, has 50% of genes in common with your gene set that is n number, number 10. So that's why we use network visualization. So we are going to our last part of the lecture, that is the introduction to network visualization using Cytoscape. So Cytoscape is an open source software for visualizing complex networks, and there are lots of, of apps that are available. So networks, the advantage of network is that it can represent relationships between the data. So you can discover new, relation, re, new relationships, and also you can visualize multiple data types together. So two important uh, words are nodes and edges. So nodes are the, are the circle, and edges are the lines that connect the nodes. And so if you do pathway and enrichment analysis, you have two types of network. One that I will call gene gene network, which is actually more like a protein protein network, but one circle would represent a gene. And the line would represent the association between these two genes. And the other kind of network would be a pathway network, where one node represents a pathway, and the line between two nodes represent the genes that are overlapping between these two pathways. So one, another important information is the layout. So the network layout. So if we don't apply any layout, it will look like a hairball. So the, the most common layout in Cytoscape network is the force directed layout. So in the force directed layout, the nodes are repelling each other but if they are connected by edges, the edges pull the nodes together like springs. So you have two forces, repelling and pulling. So for me, it was a bit difficult to understand the force directed layout until I could see it as videos. So if you are interested, you can do after the workshop, go to these links and, and see the video of the force directed layout. And here are like a few snapshots. So that would be. Step one is a little like a hairball. And you see that some nodes are overlapping. But then we are applying the force directed layout, and the nodes are going to repel each other. So we are going to see that the distance between the nodes are increasing. But this one, for example, here, they are highly connected by edges. So they, they kind of form a cluster. Then we go to step three, and we see now that it's spread out. And here, I would say this is the end result. So there is no more overlapping between the nodes. So for us, it's better to visualize. But still, if the nodes are highly interconnected, then they form these clusters. So that's what we call the force directed layout. So before we start the lab, an introduction to Cytoscape. So when you open Cytoscape, you have three different panels. On your left, you have the control panel. At the bottom, you have the table panel. And at the right, you have the result panel. And so you can save your session. So you have when you have done your network, you can save your session to reload it later. You can save the network image as any format as you want, PDF, PNG. Um, also, another feature is to be able to nav navigate for the network. So you have your network on this window. You go 
in the control panel, you click on network and you will see like a blue square and you can move this blue square to navigate for the network. So force directed layout is the most popular layout, but you can try different ones like the circular layout. You can play with colors and you can play with shapes and you can end up with a beautiful network. So what have we learned that networks are useful for seeing relationships in large data sets, that they are useful for integrating several data sets and types together. It's important to understand what the nodes and edges mean. Automatic layout is required to visualize the networks. And visual attributes enable multiple types of data to be shown at once. So it's useful to see the relationships between the genes. And there are many applications available for Cytoscape, more than 200. So you can go to the Cytoscape App Store and click on, on the icons to see a description of the applications. So they have different categories. So apps uh, involved in pathway analysis, some involved in gene expression analysis, or literature mining or pathway comparison. So depending on what you want to do, maybe there is an app that is available for you. And it's a software that is in constant development. It's an active community uh, with more than 5,000 downloads per month. So slides from Gary, Quaid, Lincoln, Daniel, myself. And we are ready to start the lab practical.